given unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. The Lord will add his blessing to the reading and to the meditating on his precious word this morning. The book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is a tremendously important book in the New Testament. Many believe that it is on a plane with the book of Romans in importance. Certainly it is with regard to salvation and of our drawing near to God. The book of Romans was written by Paul and it was written to reveal the necessity of the Christian faith. It is a defense of the gospel. It is a defense of the salvation wrought by Christ on Calvary's tree. There in the book of Romans we learn how that each has a great need and that we must be saved. How that we all have sinned and, and we've come short of the glory of God. And how that we need to be saved from the penalty of those sins. Saved from wrath through Him. And that it is found only in the Savior. It is found only in Christ. Paul says in chapter 8 of, of Romans, Now therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no judgment awaiting those who have received him, those who have trusted him by faith, who have believed on him, who have received from him the free gift of eternal life made possible through the dying of the Lord Jesus on the cross at, at Calvary. The book of Romans, it presents to us the necessity of the Christian faith the book of Hebrews. It was written, many believe, including this speaker, by Paul, but we're not positive of that, and so we leave it there. But that the book of, of, of Hebrews, it was written to reveal the superiority of the Christian faith over all that preceded it, and especially Judaism that, that they were coming out of. It's interesting that in the book of Hebrews, he uses the word better, 13 times as he compares Christianity to Judaism. For instance, in chapter 7 and verse 19, he talks about a better hope. And in verse 22 of, of, of 7, of a better covenant. In chapter 8 and verse 6, uh, of, of better promises. And of chapter 9, verse 23, that in Christianity, better sacrifices. And those are just a few of the many that he refers to as he compares Christianity to, Christ, to, to Judaism. Not, not that the law wasn't good, the law of Moses. It was good. In fact, in Romans 7 and 12, Paul says that it was holy and it was just and it was good. It was good. It was given by God. It was good. But what the writer to the book of the Hebrews is teaching us is that something far better has come and has replaced it. And that, beloved, is grace. Law has been replaced by grace, the grace of God. And that grace was manifested in so great salvation that God now offers to whosoever will. It's far better. And we praise God this morning that the best is yet to come. 
the Lord Jesus himself is coming again to take us to be with himself in glory. A key verse in the book of Hebrews is in chapter 3, verse 1. The writer says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the holy call, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. It's an admonition that the writer gives to his readers, to those who are believers, to those who are partakers of the heavenly calling. He exhorts us to direct our minds carefully toward him. Wrap your mind around him, is basically what he's saying. Fix your eyes on him. Behold him. Examine him. Examine his credentials. Examine his claims. Attend to him. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Why? Because only in him and because of him is Christianity superior to all that has gone before. We are enjoying to consider him. Trust will do that even this morning. Now verses 1 to 3 of Hebrews 1, which we looked at the last time we spoke back in January, really forms the introduction to the whole letter, to the whole epistle. And in those three verses, the writer, the writer sets the theme by presenting to us the superiority of Christ over the Old Testament prophets, all of them. They spoke for God to Israel. They spoke to the fathers, these holy men of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were his messengers and they delivered his message at sundry times. Here a little, there a little. At different times, God would raise up a man and he would speak for God, the prophets. But their message, it was partial. It was fragmentary. It was never complete. But then, in the fullness of time, God sent the apostle our profession. Moses prophesied concerning this one who was to come in Deuteronomy 18 and 18. Moses talked about a prophet who was to come from among his brethren. This messenger of God and from God who would not only speak for God but who spoke as God. This one who in God's time was born in Bethlehem, a baby boy, God's final messenger. And he was none other than the Son of God. What was it that the angel Gabriel, who also was sent from God, in Luke 1 26 what was it that he said to Mary the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also that holy thing I like the way the King James has that you, you understand I'm a little partial towards the King James I like the language of it that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's why in John 1.1 1, 1, it's called the Word. Unlike the Old Testament prophets, his revelation of God's will, his revelation of God's Word, it was complete. It was full. It was final. It was perfect. He told out God. All that God wanted to say to us, it was said. 
by the word. And why? Because this one was not merely a man like the Old Testament prophets were. He was God in human flesh. Paul in 1 Timothy 3.16 describes it that he was God manifest in the flesh. And his purpose in these introductory verses is to reveal that this one who came in the fullness of time was far superior to the Old Testament prophets who were the messengers of God in the Old Testament. But he was superior. Why? Well, he told us. He tells us. It is because of who he was. And he gives you in verses 2 and 3 seven wonderful things <clears throat> about him which distinguish him above all of the others all of the other servants of God who came down through the centuries in the Old Testament first of all in verse 2 and we looked at it last time but we'll just look at it quickly <clears throat> he says of, of the Lord whom he hath appointed heir of all things is the heir by whom he hath appointed all the... He, he, he is the heir. He is the master. He is the, the ruler. He is the Lord of all things. He inherits all things. He's the heir. Secondly, he's the, he's the creator. By whom also he made the worlds. That's why they're his. The cattle on a thousand hills. They're his. He made them. He's the, he's the creator. Paul in, in Colossians 1 and 16, speaking about the Son, he says, For by him were all things created. They were created by him and they were created for him. He's the creator. John in, in, in John 1 3, in his prologue, he, thinks that, he says that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's why he's superior to the Old Testament prophets. He was the creator. And then thirdly, he is, he, is the rep, he is the representation of God's being. And he gives you two uh, descriptors, if you will, of that. First of all, he is the brightness of his glory. He is the effulgence of his glory. That's the outward shining of the glory of God, the insignia of deity. That which, that, that which reveals God. In the Old Testament, it was the Shekinah. But the Lord Jesus is the demonstration. He is the representation of, of God's being. He's the brightness of his glory. He is the express image of his person. I think that has to do more inwardly. It has to do with, with his substance, with his essence. Of all that God is, he was. He's the express image of his, of his person. Of the same essence. Then he is the upholder of all things uh, by the word of, of his power. He is the sustainer of all things. He is the governor of the universe. He upholds and holds all things together. He is the preserver. He is the maintainer of the universes. They hold together because of the word of his power. That's what makes him so superior to the Old Testament prophets. And then sixthly, he is, he is the priest. It says who purged our sins. He is the priest who made that one offering that enables God to cleanse my soul of the very stain of sin. That's that word purge. It means cleansing, purifying. When he by himself purged our sins. You see, not only is he the apostle of our profession that we are to consider, but he's the high priest. That's a priestly work. That's not an apostle's work. That's a priestly work, purging the soul of the stain of sin. That's what he did at Calvary. This one who was prophet and who was priest. And then, seventhly, he is king. What did he do when his work was done? What did he do when God raised him from the dead? He sat down. It's interesting, in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 3, he, he is set down. That, that's the work of another. 
But in Hebrews 1, he sat down of himself. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The writer is saying that he is far greater than an earthly prophet. Where is he now? Where is he this morning? He is seated in the highest station. He is seated in the highest place that heaven has. He is seated on the throne of heaven. It says in, in Hebrews 10 and 13, from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. He's just waiting now. He's waiting. But he's on the throne, and that's what the writer is saying. The highest place of honor and dignity in heaven is his. The place of absolute authority and rule, it's where the sovereign sits. It's, it, it's the focal point of heaven. It's where the monarch sits. It's where God sits. It's where he sits. Because he's equal with God. He's the king of glory. It's the place, by the way, he left when he came to earth as the son of man. He left the throne. Now he has returned. But there's a difference. There's a difference. He left a spirit because God is spirit. Now he's a man. There's a man in the glory this morning. A glorified man. The man Christ Jesus. Flesh and bone. Why is this so? Well, it's because of what he did at Calvary. He had to become a man so that he could pay in full the price that we owed as men and women. Paid as a man. He paid that price at Calvary when he by himself purged our sins. You know, it's going to take much of Hebrews to develop that. All he's doing, he's just introducing it. He just mentions it as one of the criteria, one of the descriptors of Christ, purged our sins. It takes, it takes some chapters to, to really plumb the depths of that whole theme. But there is a man seated on the right hand of the majesty on high. And he's now the rightful heir of all things. He is the rightful heir. He is the Lord of this earth. Not only by the right of creation, not only because he made all things, but because he purchased it. He bought it back with his own blood on Calvary's tree. It's interesting to note what he said just before the Lord Jesus ascended back to heaven in Matthew 28 and 18. For the first time, the Lord Jesus said, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That, that authority is the power to rule. He now had it because of what he did when he came. We're not going to get to it much this morning, next time. But Psalm 2, Messianic, all the way through. And in Psalm 2, the son quotes Jehovah. The son quotes the Lord. And he, and he, and he tells us what, the, what, what Jehovah said to him. And he says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's what God has said to the son. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations. He hasn't done that yet hasn't happened yet but it's going to in God's time when he's ready he's going to come again and he's going to claim his rightful inheritance I want to ask you this morning whose side are you on? are you on the Lord's side? you know he died for you he purchased your redemption on Calvary's cross 
He wants you. He wants to save you from your sin. He wants you to spend eternity with him in glory. That's why he came, you know. But in order for you to do that, you have to trust him. Psalm 2 and 12. We're not going to get there. But Psalm 2 and 12, it says, kiss the son. Do obeyance to the king. Literally, it means kiss his feet. Do homage. Revere him. Bow the knee before the king of glory. The lover of your soul. Trust in him with all your heart. I trust you'll do that if you haven't already tonight, this morning. Now with verse 4, the writer begins the first distinct section of the book and it goes to the end of chapter 2. And what his intent is, is to reveal the superiority of the Messiah over every object esteemed by Israel. And that's not just the end of 2, that's, that's all the way through to about chapter 10. It's his goal to prove that no matter how elevated, how venerated, how prized, how adored, how sacred, the objects that Israel worshipped, that, that, that Israel had as part of their, of their religion, the writer says that they all pale in comparison to this one who has come. This one who is now the center and the circumference of our faith. This one who is the light and life of Christianity. It, it, it reminds me of, of that time when the Lord Jesus took his three disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, up unto that high mount in Matthew 17. And there he was transfigured before them. His face, it, it, it shone like the sun, and his clothing, it glistened. And suddenly there appeared Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter, dear Peter, he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And he wanted to build three booths, three, three tents, three tabernacles, if you will. One for each of those three to sit in, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Suddenly, the Bible says there was a bright cloud, and it overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The Bible says they were sore afraid. They fell to the ground, and when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. The Father would not permit the glory of the Son to be shared with anyone else. They simply faded away. And all they saw was Jesus. And what the Holy Spirit is going to do in this book is he is going to select one object after another from the Old Testament and he's going to hold them up as it were in the presence of the Son and he is going to reveal the infinite superiority of the Messiah over all of them. In each case their glory will be eclipsed and the Lord Jesus will be alone. And we'll see only him. That's God's intent. Now it says in verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now having shown the infinite elevation above the prophets, the writer will now reveal his immeasurable superiority over the angels. Having proved Christ to be more excellent than the most excellent of men, even those moved by the Holy Spirit to write the word of God, he will now tell us that he is more excellent than the celestial and immortal spirits of heaven. The most excellent of God's creatures. One has said of verse 4 that it could be termed the text. And the remainder of the, of the, of the chapter, the exposition or the sermon, based on verse 4. Now it seems almost a blemish to open a new paragraph, to open a new thought with a participle. I used to teach grammar and uh, 
that's true. It's not the best way to, to start a new paragraph. But then we note that verse 4 really isn't a, isn't a new sentence. It's a continuation of verses 1 to 3. And, it, and it, it has a dual purpose. Not only does it set the scene for the first major section of the epistle, which goes to the end of, of, of chapter 2, teaching the superiority of Christ over the angels, but it concludes the introduction. It, it completes the thoughts expressed concerning him. Therefore, it is closely and inseparably united to verses 1 to 3, being made so much better than the angels. At the very outset, he says of Christ that he is vastly superior to the angels, being made so much better. It's an idiom in the Greek. And, and, and it's an idiom used to measure the distance between. It, it's used to compare. It, it, it's used to, to give the degree of difference, made so much better. What he is saying is that the distance between the Messiah and the angels it's immeasurable it's incomprehensible it's infinite now you have to you, you have to appreciate the high regard angels were held in by Israel they were regarded as the most exalted of God's creatures they were his ministers they excelled in strength the Psalms tell us they did his bidding. Often they were used by God to communicate his message to men, as Gabriel did to Daniel in Daniel 10, as the interpreting angel did to Zechariah in Zechariah 1.9. Often the manifestations of the pre-incarnate Christ were in the form of an angel, the angel of the Lord. But perhaps the greatest reason they were revered was because of their part in communicating the law to Moses on Sinai. Stephen in Acts 7 and 53 <clears throat> told Israel that they received the law by the disposition of angels. Paul in Galatians 3.19 says that the law was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. They had a part to play in the giving of the law. Thus in the mind of the Jew, they were highly regarded. Their revealings, especially the law, were messages from God and, and, and as such, they were trustworthy and, and, and they were authentic and they were binding. And if people were to put themselves under a new revelation, they would have to be shown, they would have to be shown that, that, that the new was superior to the old and, and that the new revelation came through a messenger, came through a person superior to the angels who have always been the messengers of God. And that this one possessed greater glory and greater dignity and greater honor than angels. It would mean that he was the most excellent of all. And thus the writer tells them of Christ having been made so much better than the angels. Was there a time when he wasn't? Was there a time when he was a little lower than the angels? Not as the eternal son he was. But as the Messiah he was. As the messianic son, if you will. It's when he purged our sins. See, and that's the connection between three and four. It's when he left his throne and his kingly crown and he came to earth for me. It's when he, for our sakes, became poor that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. It's when he took on a new form, the form of a servant that Paul talks about in Philippians 2 7. It's when he was made in the likeness of men. And at Calvary, sunk to the lowest depths on the cross. 
when he subjected himself to death, even the death of the cross. You see, angels can't die, but as man, he could. He had the power over it. No man taketh it from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. But he had that power. But for our sakes, to redeem us back to God, to be able to purge our souls of the very stain of sin, he came. And he took the humble place, took the low place. And for our sakes, he came to to redeem us back to God, to to purge our sins of the very stain of sin. But to do that, he had to to bear our sins and its terrible penalty and then die for our sins. And he did. Praise God on the third day. What did God do? He raised him up. It says that in Acts 2, 24. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And Peter in Acts 5, 31 says, Him hath God exalted to his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Paul in Ephesians 1, 20. He has set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. He's been made so much better than the angels now. How do you know that? Where is he now? Where is the man Christ Jesus? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This one who came and who took on him, not the nature of angels, but who took on him the seed of Abraham, He is seated in the highest station in heaven. He has been exalted to the right hand of God with angels, his servants, attending him as they surround the throne. That's how great the distance is between the exalted Christ and the angels. It's incomprehensible. It's beyond comparison. Peter says of the resurrected Christ in 1 Peter 3.22, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being subjected to him. He is now a man whom God hath highly exalted, whom God has exalted and extolled and made very high. God has glorified him. He is sitting on the throne, far superior to angels possessing a far greater glory and dignity and authority and a power than ever angels had. And therefore, he's worthy. Worthy of your trust. He's worthy of you leaving your religion and coming out to him for. He's far better. He's worthy of you trusting him with your soul for eternity. He's trustworthy. He's the only one who cared enough for you to come and die that he might save your soul. Being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Angels have names. I believe every angel in heaven has a name. I believe it was given to that angel by God. Michael, the archangel, His name means who is as God. Gabriel, man of God. Lucifer, the shining one. God changed his name to Satan, the adversary. But there's one in heaven with a more excellent name than they. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Name is that. Here's where I can get myself into some trouble. Differ with me if you will. I believe the name that God has given him is the name of Son. He's the Son. Look at verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. We'll talk about that another time. Good verse.
Five times John refers to him as the Monongenes, the only begotten son. Four in the gospel, one in the epistle. It's descriptive of who he is. You see, that's what a name in Old Testament times or New Testament times did. It was descriptive of who you are. Who is he? He's the sole representative of God, of his being and of his character. Son, it is, subject, it is suggestive of the deepest affection that God has for him. How many times did he call him my beloved, my darling, the darling of my bosom, the son? We get something of the passion. We get something of the love that God has for him, has for the son. You see, the one, this blessed one who came from heaven wasn't just another angel. He wasn't just another messenger. He wasn't just another intermediary. He wasn't just another emissary. The one who came was the only son of the living God. What is it that Isaiah said? Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. He gave his son. He gave the very best that heaven had for your soul and mine. He loved his son. I don't have time to, 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 to go into the parable that we talked about last time of the householder. You'll remember it perhaps. He sent servants to collect the rent in Matthew 21. And they killed the servants. And finally, the householder, who is a picture of the father, I believe, he said, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send my well-beloved son, it says in Mark. I just saw that this morning. Surely they will reverence him because he's the heir. The son is always the heir, you see. But what did they say? He's the heir. Let's kill him and get his inheritance. And that's what they did. They killed the son. And that scripture finishes up what will he do. That is the householder, the father. What will he do unto those farmers. My friends, he spared not his own son, but he sent him. He delivered him up for us all on that cross at Calvary. There, our beloved Savior, he, he purchased our redemption. He won the right. Someday he's going to open those seals of Revelation 5. It's the title deeds to this earth. He won the right to do that with his own blood on Calvary's tree. Praise God, he's coming again. This one who is superior to the angels, superior to the prophets, superior to the fathers, superior to everything and, and, and everyone that has ever gone before him. And that's why the writer says, as he concludes the book and as we conclude this sermon, let us therefore go forth unto him, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. What's your response to so great salvation? What is your response to the Savior of sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ? You can admire him and say good things about him and walk away. Or you can do what God has already done. You can crown him Lord of your life. You can bend the knee you can give him first place in your heart. You can open your heart and you can receive his free gift of salvation. And go from here with him in your heart. And you can begin to do that, what you're going to do through the endless ages of eternity. You can begin to praise him. You can begin to honor him. You can begin to magnify and to glorify and to worship this one who loved you gave himself for you, for his name's sake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your holy presence this morning hour. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for your great love, the love of the Father. And yet, our Father, that, that, that love was, was so great that you, you spared not your own son, this one whom you love, with everlasting love. 
And yet for our sakes you sent the darling of your bosom. You sent your own and only son into this world with the express purpose of Father of dying in our room instead, of paying the price for our redemption. And Father, for this we, we thank you. And we thank you for the love of the Son in coming, in giving his life. And Father, we're so thankful that he finished that work. You attested to it by raising him from the dead and by highly exalting him, giving him uh, every glory raising him to the highest station. Father, our, our, our desire this morning is that each of us has come to the Son, the Savior of sinners, and we have received him as our only Savior. May this be so in each of our hearts. Bless thy word then to each of our souls this day, we pray. Dismiss us now with thy blessing and take us to our homes in safety as we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus.